very glad to be here this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, exciting program that we've got here. So let me give you just a very quick introduction to Diebold. We never say die, just for future reference. <laughs> Nobody wants die in their company name unless you're selling grave plots or something like that. So it's Diebold. Uh, we're about a 150-year-old company. Uh, we like to think that we don't look a day over 130. We've been in the security space that entire time. So we originally started out uh, building safes. And what put us on the map was that after the Chicago fire, one of the few things that was left in every bank building was a Diebold safe still standing there. Uh, since then, we've become a large supplier of security solutions and transaction solutions to banks around the world. So we're in 90 countries, about 16,000 employees. We're number seven on the FinTech 100 list, about $3 billion in revenue. Uh, the primary products that you'd see from us out in the world, besides security solutions, would be ATMs, of course. Okay? So we sit at kind of the intersection of digital payments and physical payments, and that value exchange between those two mediums. And that comes with a lot of really interesting security problems. Okay? Uh, thinking about that from a very often software-centric view at an institution like this, you might say, oh, Devin, everybody does everything digitally. Who the hell uses cash? What's it matter? Right? Um, the truth is, that as we see digital payments increase, you actually see more usage of cash and more interplay between those two things. So if you look at the most extreme example in a place like Kenya, right, they've digitized their entire payments ecosystem. About 80% of the population uses a single app in order to transfer money between individuals. They saw the usage of cash actually rise within the country as a whole. So that interplay is, is really important, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing to try to secure. So, um, you know, when, when we think about security and the interplay of cybersecurity and physical security, uh, to us, we're, we're very interested in, you know, the rise in payments. We're very interested in authentication. I truly believe that authentication is one of the important battlegrounds in fintech for the next several years. Uh, and, you know, security solutions that span between the two. So, physical security, right? Um, People very, very rarely think of you know, the attacks on bank infrastructure uh, in, in terms of the physical aspect, but I'll give you some kind of numbers behind this. If you run in and try to rob a bank, you're at, if successful, your average take is about $25,000. Okay? That's not very much money in order to put yourself on a felony list right, and run around with a, with a gun. However, the ATM you passed on the way into the bank had about $200,000 in it, okay? on average. Can't have well more. So what we see around the world is this interesting uh, kind of flip-flop in how people attack a bank. Right? So in Europe, they've moved to EMV chip cards. If you're familiar with the chip cards, they've uh, encrypted the data from the magnetic stripe on your credit card. When you go to Europe now, it's harder and harder to use an American MagStripe card. And what that means is also harder to skim your card data. Okay? As soon as it became harder to skim your card data and steal your credit card or debit card credentials, the thieves all said, okay, well, how are we going to make money now? And they started attacking things physically because it got harder to attach, attack them digitally. In physical security, the attacks pretty much always follow the cheapest locally available form of exploit. Right? So in Latin America, where there's a lot of mining, right, that will be dynamite. Uh, in Europe, where they're a little more sophisticated and they don't feel like chasing the ATM down the block after it goes sky high, uh, they use gas and they pump it in and then blow that up. Uh, in the good old US of A, where we have a lot of construction equipment and we pride ourselves on really big trucks, you just loop it with a chain, floor the gas, hope for the best, send your friends up to pick up the pieces usually destroy most of it anyway, um, but we see uh, hundreds and hundreds of these attacks. Even just looking at gas attacks, there's a few per day in Europe. Uh, so we have a, a really interesting problem. The thing that happens in the background is once this, is, uh, this unit is destroyed, blown up, et cetera, we have 28 USB ports that are connected to the financial institution's infrastructure, and now those are exposed. Right? So we need a layer of digital security to prevent an exploit from trying to attack that conduit into the bank now. 
So that's kind of the quick intro to the, the physical security attacks. You, you'll notice um, we don't know all the, uh, the numbers here. A, lo a lot of the exploits are in, uh, in Latin America, and they're not really divulged. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge problem. They don't really make off with a lot of money, despite some valiant attempts. The interesting thing is when cybersecurity and physical security meet, all of a sudden we see some really interesting attacks. So uh, the bottom's being cut off here, so I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, this was an attack that happened, I believe it was last summer, and uh, it got played in the press as an ATM heist. Okay, And it, within New York City, uh, these two jokers and some of their friends made off with 2.4 million, and the initial um, press was that these two geniuses hacked ATMs. They didn't actually. These guys were mules. Uh, what happened in the background was much more sophisticated and far more interesting. A hacking team broke into a data center uh, housed in, I believe, the UAE. Okay, and I won't say who operated the data center, but if you use them, you might want to move your hosting. Uh, they hacked into the data center. They got into the card vault that holds all of the card credentials for this particular bank's customer base. They, the bank made the mistake of housing all of their PIN information unencrypted. right? And your PIN is not a password, right? It is a special regulatory four-digit designation, okay? When you put a four digits into your phone, that is not a PIN. A PIN can only be input on an encrypted device, okay? So it's never stored in the clear. Somebody stored it in the clear. This hacking group got all that card information, got all of the PIN information, started printing out their own Magstripe cards. They then went back in and upped the daily limit to thousands of dollars for withdrawals, and then quietly closed the door behind them and exited the hack. Then they sent an army of these type geniuses out to go to the ATMs with copied cards and basically empty them. So around the world, uh, this attack took place over, I believe, a little over a week. They made $45 million in cash. The beautiful thing for these guys was that's cash. Right? They didn't have to do the normal card exploit, which is I steal your credit card data, I go online, I buy a bunch of you know, Beats by Dre headphones and crap like that, and I have it you know, delivered to somebody's house, and then I have to find a way to sell that, and on the arbitrage, it's just I don't know why anybody wastes their time with that, but lots of people do. In this case, good old cash, once it's gone, it's gone. Right. So to us, that's a much more interesting problem to solve. How do you protect both the physical assets and protect them against a cyber threat. So where we see these two things meeting uh, really comes down in, in many times to authentication. Okay? In the case of this particular uh, exploit that I was talking about before, with the geniuses aforementioned, uh, the exploit there was that they got the key to getting into your, your, uh, your account data, which was the PIN. Okay? And banking infrastructure is secured by really only two things. Something you have, which is a 16-digit number, i.e. a credit or debit card, and a PIN that supposedly only you know. But you might have written it on a Post-it note. Somebody might have stored it in the clear. Hell, you might have written it on the back of the card. right? Uh, we're looking at, at ways to extend that security. Uh, to include um, also something you are, right? So our first step, we replace the card with a phone because the phone can be turned on and off if it's exploited. All of a sudden, if somebody, if, you, if I steal your phone and it has your card credentials, you call your bank, I turn your phone off, it's dead, right? Not the same with the card. So we've replaced the card with a phone for authentication and we're adding biometrics to the system so that you can't, uh, you have to have something you are, right? And there's been early lessons learned in that space uh, we move from finger to palm vein technology because palm vein verifies that the user is in fact alive. Amazingly enough, somebody will steal your finger in order to get your money. Um, so you want to have live verification. And uh, we've also done clever things to, to get around uh, card skimming attacks, such as simply rotating cards. Okay? A skim is reliant on the fact that the card is pushed over a read head. If you turn it sideways and the read head is motorized, the person, uh, the skimming device can't do it anymore. So we found a lot of kind of interplay between cyber and physical security that's actually increased the security in banking as a whole. So looking forward to talking to everybody. Thanks for the time. 
Thanks for your attention. Really appreciate it.